Thank you for being part of today's webinar. It's really lovely to see you and thank you for being part of Marble Hill Revived. Marble Hill Revived is a really exciting project with eight million pounds being invested in the site, in our park, in our landscape, and it'll see the house being open free for five days a week. It will see the landscape being um, reinterpreted and invested in so it's a more biosecure space, but also with those amazing heritage uh, parts brought back to life. And also see um, lots of events and also the most wonderful archaeology that has been happening on site. And a lot of the landscape uh, creations have been underpinned by some fantastic research by Historic England. And it's this is the reason why we're here today, um, to uh, understand a little bit more about part of that archaeology that was the grotto. And you may well have seen that there are other talks that we've hosted about uh, the grotto, but understanding the evolving history of our site is something that is absolutely Absolutely wonderful and we are delighted to welcome back Thomas Cromwell this evening. We're also delighted to welcome Leonie Price. As part of the Marble Hill Revived project uh, a lot of work has been done investing in people with our five apprenticeships and also um, working with fantastic young people who are understanding more about our site and it's lovely to have Leonie with us to share about some of the things that she's been finding. So um, it is with great delight that I get to introduce these wonderful speakers uh, Thomas Cromwell is our project manager for all of the um, Historic England archaeology on site and it has been a delight to work with him and to be able to do lots of the community outreach to share about his fantastic findings. And I mentioned about Leonie um, before. She's a PhD student looking into 17th and 18th century material culture. And as part of a three month placement at English Heritage, she's been exploring more about the shells and the grotto and indeed how those shells got to the grotto in uh, lowly Twickenham Marble Hill. So it is with great delight that I get to welcome these wonderful speakers for this evening's talk and thank you in advance to them and we hope you enjoy. I'm delighted to be joined by Leonie as a co-presenter on this and that the aim really of tonight's talk is to answer some of the questions that we left hanging in the September talk. So I hadn't planned to go into too much depth about the material we've already covered. Uh, but for anyone who isn't familiar with the site and um, you know, the, the various projects that we've already been undertaking on it, um, this is an aerial view of, of the park at Marble Hill, uh, as we all know and love it. The house is roughly in the middle, uh, bracketed by the two large clumps of trees. The grotto that we're going to be talking about tonight is about halfway down between the house and the river. So where the star is there. And most importantly, the talk that I gave in September, which covered a lot about the history of the grotto, its development and our involvement in the project that I'm not going to repeat tonight, can be found on YouTube. There's a link there, which um, is a bit of um, alphabet soup, or you can simply go to YouTube and in the search box type in Marble Hill Grotto. And the first thing that comes up is the September talk. And it's worth doing that if you haven't already seen it. Um, it's worth looking at that after this talk to put what we're talking about into some context. Because like I said, there isn't really the time to go over all of that again tonight. Okay, um, right. So the grotto up until last winter looked roughly like this, a large collection of bushes. Um, and if you ventured down the steps between the bushes, there's a, a, an enclosed bit of um, stonework, which um, is lovely to see, but it was very isolated and sheltered. And all of it, pretty much, is 1980s work. None of it is historic grotto in terms of the, the, the features that we could see outside of the, the actual chamber. And the reason for that, and we have photographs of them rebuilding it, by the way, in the 1980s, so we know for a fact that all the stonework is late edition stuck onto engineering brick. Um, the reason for that, of course, is the grotto had been lost and it was rediscovered twice. First in 1941, 
um, because it had been backfilled sometime probably in the late 19th century, um, so as to just be a, a, a shallow depression in the landscape, um, which was then filled in with bricks sometime between World Wars One and Two, we think. Um, and it wasn't rediscovered until a tree fell on it and broke through the vaulting of the brick chamber in 1941. Uh, and we have our classic man from the ministry standing on the edge looking into a neatly trimmed um, excavation to um, expose the chamber. And then it was backfilled again and forgotten once more for another generation until it was rediscovered again in 1984 and re-excavated because the ground had been subsiding into the into the backfilled soil that they put into the hole. Um, at this point, it was decided to display the site properly to actually open it out as a feature, at which point that work that the GLC did that I showed in the earlier drawing uh, was um, executed upon the site and was mainly, as I say, guided by best concepts of what a grotto ought to look like but with no historical evidence of exactly what this one looked like. And that evidence didn't really crop up until a few years ago when just prior to the start of the Marble Hill Revived project, this map was, was unearthed in, I believe the Norfolk Record Office, uh, which was drawn about 1749, 1750. Um, and it, you'll see that it shows the grotto down in the sort of lower right-hand end of, of the formal gardens. And we can zoom in on that. And this is the, the grotto as recorded during uh, Lady Henrietta Howard's lifetime. So it's, it's a very different beast to the one that the GLC created in 1987, 88. I can't remember exactly when they finished. Some of the plans are dated as late as 1989. Um, and we see that there's an entrance to the grotto. Uh, there's a letter E next to it. And there's a key in the corner of the map that actually says E is grotto. So we know exactly what it's supposed to be. And we see that it sits in a large depression. Um, the, the sort of forecourt to the grotto, um, which I've been calling the grotto bowl. Um, so we have the grotto chamber, which is the brick room um, that was rediscovered in 1941. We have the grotto bowl that it sits in, the depression that allows you to get from ground surface down into the grotto because it, the difference in height between the ground and the floor inside the grotto chamber is about 10 feet. So you have to somehow get down slope into that. So they, they have a, a large depression that it sits in. And um, there's a, a foyer space in front of it, uh, which was enclosed by those stone walls that we saw earlier in that slide with the, the weird brick sort of mound in the middle of the floor. And we'll see more of that in a moment. Right, so we knew exactly where it was because in 2017, we had a number of excavation trenches that all found bits of it around the edges. So we were able to work out that that's roughly the shape of the depression that we were looking for that forms the Grotto Bowl. Um, and that then guided us in the excavations that uh, we carried out in August and September. And the idea is that we were, we were excavating it partly to find out about the grotto and partly to enable English heritage to hopefully restore it to something more akin to its, its original size and shape, rather than the, the smaller um, access way that was sculpted in 1980, whatever. Okay, so uh, in 2017, this is one of the trenches that caught the edge of the Grotto Bowl, um, just outside the steps at the eastern end. And we can see the slope in the trench going down. And at the bottom of that, we had a couple of small depressions that we thought at the time looked suspiciously like the bottom ends of some sort of um, planting pits, so for shrubs or, or whatever, uh, which we, we then found out was the case because we found some elsewhere uh, this year when we were digging, uh, which is good because it allows us to key the map into its exact location. And it turns out it's, it's surprisingly accurate, the 1749. Um, so you can actually use it as a blueprint to rebuild the grotto. Right, so these are the planting pits. Um, we also found other bits of edge of the grotto cut in some of the other trenches. And then this year, um, we were able to actually go into the grotto and do some work as part of, of what we were doing on site. So this is inside the main chamber. Uh, you can see the, the top of the archway where the collapse happened. All the yellow brick at the top is GLC work in the 1980s with a big concrete roof on the top. Um, 
This is the south wall of the, the chamber. Uh, essentially, if you go in and turn left, and you can see it's covered in these circular marks uh, where shells have been applied to it, which have all since come off. And you can also see to the right hand end, the corner of the brickwork is obscured by what we call rustication, which is where they build out from the brickwork with uh, mortar and stones and coral and so on to try and round off the edges and make it look more like a cave rather than a brick box. And you can see on the left hand side that rustication is mostly gone and therefore we can see sharp edges to the brickwork. Okay, and this is the back wall or the west wall as it is. Uh, we'll come back to that later on in the talk. And then of course the north side, and it's, well, this is a bit dark in the left hand bottom corner, you can see more circular shell marks on the wall. And then of course this is looking east, sort of out through the archway and up the flight of steps. So this is more or less the condition we found the grotto in, although we did a, a fair amount of cleaning before these photos took place. Um, and then the floor itself, a bit of a revelation, um, is quite heavily decorated in terms of panels of flints, which are these um, dark sort of gray um, stones, and then um, water-worn pebbles, uh, which are the more sort of tan colored materials, obviously laid out in a pattern of some sort, complete with around the, the north side at least, knuckle bone edging, which is essentially the leg bones of sheep. It's the sort of the knee joint actually, rather than a knuckle, although it's called knuckle bone. And they're set upright and it makes a nice pattern. Um, it's a common thing in 17th and 18th century um, garden buildings on big estates to, to use this as decoration. And there would have been lots of raw material lying about because every time you, um, you, you know, butcher an animal in order to create dinner, uh, you wind up with lots of bones left over. And these were the days before they had the kind of machinery to mince it all up into bone meal for fertilizer. Um, so instead it was used for all sorts of things, including essentially it was the early plastic used for things like knife handles and, and such. Um, and in this case, used as decoration around the edges of a floor. Okay, and this is a photo mosaic of the floor inside the grotto chamber. Um, don't worry about the fact that the colors don't match. It's because this was a, a quick process just to get it, an image. Um, we haven't really color balanced the photos on this, but it's mainly so that we could use it as an underlay for tracing off the actual features on the floor into a scale plan. And you can see we've got these areas I just highlighted in blue, which are uh, made from flints. They, they took roughly fist sized nodules of flint, split them in half, and then laid them with the split side facing up uh, to get that nice rich dark bluey gray color um, as patches. And then you can see how that contrasts with the other areas of um, where they've got the pebbles. Uh, we also have along this north side, roughly where I've just highlighted in yellow, the, the knuckle bone edging, um, which follows the rustication. It doesn't follow the, the brick wall, it follows the decoration that was applied to that brick. So it's clearly part of the design that involved the rustication. And on the south side, where we expected more knuckle bone, we instead found a row of flints around the edge which we think are original. It isn't that they replace the bone edging. I think that is what was originally designed. So the two sides of this chamber are different patterns. So it isn't just a symmetrical floor. It's some sort of picture that's being produced. There's a, a, a round edge uh, highlighted here in yellow where um, there had been something inserted that's been removed. We don't know exactly what, but basically it would have created a, a round frame for the central part of the floor. Maybe it was laid out as some sort of mosaic, maybe, you know, some sort of picture. Um, we unfortunately don't have most of it because at a later date, a well was inserted. Um, we think this is sometime in the 19th century as part of a change of use of the grotto. Um, it has a pipe that goes out to a similar feature outside that we'll see in a moment. And it's smashed straight through the floor. And we think the floor itself may have been obscured by this point. It may already be under a layer of, of soil or dirt. Um, and therefore, nobody took any notice of the fact they were demolishing a mosaic because it was 
it was no longer visible. So we think this is at, at least one change of use of this building. And looking outside, similar photo mosaic technique. Um, the interesting thing down, down the bottom left corner is where the, the, the gateway into the actual brick chamber is. Um, and we have the wing walls sort of top and bottom of this photo that were built in the 1980s that may be built on stubs of walling from the 1700s, but we're not entirely sure yet. There are cryptic notes in some of the, the, the 1980s reconstruction plans that suggest it. Um, we have some flint, again, set in the floor, which unfortunately runs out to the edge of where the, the modern walls sort of cut through for their foundations and thus obscure the archeology. span and it'll be quite a bit of an effort to actually get down to any surviving information if it is there. Uh, and they're set bracketing effectively a floor of pebbles. Um, we have a strange square brick foundation for a, a column, roughly half a meter uh, per side. Um, we found a fragment of this material outside the, you know, the entrance to the grotto where it had been dumped um, as part of whatever demolition. Uh, and it, it, it would appear to be some sort of freestanding um, odd column. It's, it would have been decorated with plaster and um, uh, with flint and, and shells and such. So it would have been decorated similarly to the rest of the grotto, but why there's only the one and why it's off center, we have no clue whatsoever. Um, we also again have another inserted um, well structure with a, a brick capping over it. And it's connected by a pipe. Uh, if you follow it down towards the bottom left of the image, all, that's basically a channel where they dug out, put a big ceramic pipe in between the two sumps and then buried it back over. Uh, again, for what reason, we're not entirely sure, some sort of water management. And um, if we look from the outside, looking in, so that foyer space that we were just looking at is behind that little green shrub at the top, sort of left corner of the, the image. And we're looking at, at in, the, in the middle of the top is the backside of one of those flanking walls that were built in the 1980s. And in front of it, just below the uh, red and white ranging rods, you can see a lot of brick rubble. And that's all 18th century rubble. It's all good 18th century brick with flints and bits of coral and conch shells and mortar and such as part of a demolition of some sort of 18th century feature, presumably in the 19th century. And it sits on top, so th this is the brick, and it sits on top of a cobbled surface, which is part of the original 1700s work. And at the far right end, just under the, the red and white ranging rod, you can see another half sectioned uh, planting pit. So again, helping us tie in exactly how the 1700s drawing fits with, with the archeology span in the ground. Um, but the interesting part with this is the brick not only contains loose bricks that we're, we're wondering where they come from, um, it also contains bits of broken brick vaulting. So where we have the barrel vaults over the top of the inner chamber that we saw so with the man from the ministry looking down into it, we, we have all this loose brick that presumably comes from something similar and, and chunks of vaulting as well where the, where the two barrel vaults meet. And if the, the main chamber didn't collapse until 1941, then where is this vaulting coming from? And at the moment, I'm working on the, on the idea that perhaps the foyer, the outer space just behind that little green shrub there, Perhaps that was also roofed over with a brick vault originally. And as part of a remodeling exercise, that brick vault was pulled down and the walls either side of it demolished. And that's the rubble that we're seeing here. And it's nothing to do with the, the brick vaulting that would have come down from the, from the inner chamber. Now we've yet to be able to prove that because unfortunately any evidence along those lines is underneath those 1980s walls either side. Um, and I don't know if any of it actually survives as part of that process. So um, we can have a look here. Um, 
you can see in the middle of the photo, there's a bit of cobbled surface exposed right next to that short red and white ranging rod uh, or photo scale as it is. And then just below that in the photo is a bit of that brick vaulting. So it's a, an interesting proposition that actually the grotto may have been two chambers deep, which would make more sense because the, the current chamber to the grotto, it feels a bit like it's an alcove rather than a proper cave. It doesn't feel recessed enough somehow when you go in it because there's so much daylight flooding in. But if it was the, the second of two chambers, it would be a much more remote proposition and would feel more cave-like and give more of that mystical feel that they were trying to achieve in the 18th century with these grottos. So it's, it's a possibility. Um, interestingly enough, uh, where we had rubble on the north side of the entrance, just above where the letter E is on this map, um, we also had the same brick rubble to the south side. And the, the difference between the two is the rubble on the south side, unlike the stuff on the north, contained fragments of peg tile, sort of you know, red ceramic roof tiles with holes in them for nails or wooden pegs, the kind of thing that you'd hang on a shed or any other structure. Cheap and cheerful, very common in, in the period that the grotto was open. And yet there's a collection of buildings circled in red on this, this clipping of the, the, the 1749 plan that have left no trace below ground that we can find. And I'm wondering whether they were above ground structures originally, possibly roofed with peg tile. And as part of the demolitions that pull down the outer chamber of the grotto for whatever reason, these buildings also are demolished and the peg tile from it winds up in the mix of rubble on this south side. Um, going inside the grotto, so um, this is looking just inside the left hand edge. So it's the south wall and it's the the eastern corner of it, um, we can see that the, the plastic tray full of artifacts sitting in the middle of the photo is on top of a bit of rustication where the basically the, the brickwork and, and mortar sticks out from the wall. Um, but that rustication has been pulled down. It's no longer its full height. It should have covered that entire corner, uh, but has been basically reduced down to nearly floor level. And you can see it, it extends slightly up the wall. So this red line here. And where it stops in an artificial way, um, that's the beginning of the shell impressions. So we've actually got two phases of, of decoration going on here. Uh, There's the rustication to start, which then is for whatever reason pulled down, whether, whether it starts decaying, because um, we know from uh, discussions of uh, grottos in Italy that um, the stuff, because it is subject to damp, it doesn't stay on the wall very well. And within decades of, of decorating a place like this, bits of it start falling off and have to be stuck back on. And maybe the rustication started giving way. And in this case, it was pulled down. And then the shells are put over the space that the rustication had occupied originally. So it's a completely different decoration style. So it changed whether this happens within Lady Henrietta's lifetime, or whether it's one of her successors that owns the site that does this either in the, the late 18th or early 19th century, we don't know. But it is interesting that there's multiple phases of activity going on here, uh, which ties in well with the demolition of an outer chamber and insertion of wells and all sorts of other things happening. It's a much more complex structure than we give it credit. Um, and at this point, I believe I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Leone, who will now talk about um, shells. If I can get the remote control going. There we go. Oh, fab. I think that should be working now. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Leonie Price, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Sheffield. Um, and I recently undertook a three month project placement based at Marble Hill, during which I researched the trade in shells contemporary with the creation of the grotto by Henrietta Howard in the 18th century. Uh, yeah, so the research that I carried out was a way of understanding the social and cultural context for the grotto's creation that Thomas has just been talking about, uh, as there are very few surviving documents relating specifically to Marble Hill that can give us a, a clear picture of how the shells actually made it to the grotto. 
So the decorative scheme at Marble Hill contains a high proportion of exotic shells. You can see the conch shell in the image on screen that was taken during the excavation, with the conch being the big pink coloured shell right at the front of the table. So conch definitely, they aren't native to the UK, meaning this had to have been imported. Uh, conch are often found in the Mediterranean, but the largest specimens come from the Caribbean, as well as some areas of South America. So based on preliminary assessments that were undertaken on site, looking mainly at these larger specimens of shells like the conch, it seems that many of the exotic species used in the Marble Hill Grotto were Caribbean in origin. Now we need to bear in mind that this is a first assessment and that alongside the large and medium sized shells, there are plenty of smaller examples whose exact origins are yet to be identified so that we can establish proportions more accurately and understand where uh, all of the shells were coming from. Uh, so you've just seen some pictures of the, the rustication that Thomas was talking about. And here is another image kind of similar to that. Uh, you can see how the shells might have actually been incorporated into the, into the decoration. This is a small section of the wall and the shapes that you can see there are called mold fossils. So these are not actually the shells themselves, but the molds left by them because they've been pressed into the mortar and have subsequently fallen off the surface. So these smaller shells that you can see here are the shells that need more consideration, but the already established significant presence of exotic and Caribbean shells is really worth investigating. So just to give a little bit of background, there was a huge boom in the importation of shells into Britain from the late 1600s onwards, as Europeans were ever more present on foreign shores. Shells came into the country primarily on trade ships, and they were coming in as part of larger cargoes, but they were also being picked up by individuals, so by sailors and crew members who were aware that any of the specimens they collected while they were away could bring a really good price in what was a growing market back in Britain. Some of these shells were collected to order, particularly among people in natural history circles who were studying and collecting shells. So if you knew someone uh, who was going off to, say, Jamaica as part of a voyage, you might ask if they could bring back a selection of shells for you. But that was quite rare, and for the most part, shells were trade items in and of themselves. However they were acquired, they could be found for sale from shell dealers and shopkeepers. And where shells went into private collections, they would often be resold and resold um, over the years throughout the 18th century with the dis dispersal of different estates after death. So many of these auctions of shells took place in taverns and coffee houses, like the ones that you can see mentioned in the newspaper articles on screen where they were sold in parcels of various sizes. And interestingly, even for people who potentially couldn't afford to spend money on shells or who didn't have the space or the means to store them if they were collecting them, shells were a form of entertainment. So in that little uh, article to the bottom, you can see that there's an advertisement where shells are being exhibited alongside rattlesnakes and other curiosities. Um, and people could go and visit them and look at shells and marvel at all of these goods that are being bought from afar. So yeah, back in the day, people liked their shells with a side order of exotic animals. Uh, and shell collecting was a thing. People were building up massive collections of beautiful specimens across their whole lifetimes, but so too was grotto making, although it was particularly an elite thing, grotto making. And you can see that many adverts from this period reference shells specifically for sale as a tool for grotto making. So there's a couple on screen here that make reference to parcels of grotto shells, and that's not uncommon. You do need a lot of shells to make a grotto, so there's a lot of money to be made in selling grotto shells in such quantities. Shells were also available directly to people who had established connections with shipping. We know that this is the case for the Duchess of Portland, who you can see here, who was a contemporary of Henrietta, although was a little younger, and succeeded her by 20 years. She lived until 1785, which was long enough to purchase shells from Captain Cook's voyages to Australia and the Pacific, whereas Henrietta died in 1767, just before Cook's voyage first came back, um, uh, just before Cook's first voyage came back in 1769. And the Duchess had an enormous shell collection and she built a grotto at Bulstrode Park, which you can see in this illustration here, with her close friend, the shell artist Mary Delaney. And the Duchess seems to have had agents who were able to acquire cargoes of shells on her, on her behalf. There's a really great mention of her in a letter sent by the Swedish naturalist Daniel Solander to another Swedish naturalist, Charles Linnaeus, where Solander mentions going down to the dock. And this is something many collectors seem to have done, speaking to crews who had recently returned from voyages and would probably have had lots of shells on board their ships. 
and Salander asks if they have any shells that he can purchase. Instead of the yes that he's hoping for, he actually gets told that the whole lot have already been allocated to the Duchess of Portland. So through this complaint, we know that the Duchess had the means to ensure that she was getting hold of big quantities of exotic shells that were coming into the country, and that this was an option for people with the means to acquire them. Uh, in a letter written by the Duchess to her friend, she also talks about this really great image of standing on the beach at Margate uh, during one of her visits there and being able to see ships uh, owned by the East India Company passing by at a distance. And she, she laments to the person she's writing the letter to that they were too far away for her to be able to inquire whether they had any shells on board. And I absolutely love this, the fact that she's like standing down there on the shore trying to get shells in person uh, I love that this elite woman, who you probably wouldn't expect to be doing that kind of thing, uh, was seemingly very open to acquiring her own shells like that, just in person, not going through middlemen and agents and dealers and all that kind of thing. We don't know if this is the kind of thing that Henrietta would have been doing, as documents unfortunately don't survive. And thus far, we haven't found any little anecdotes like that along the way. But that's not to say that one day we won't uncover them. And uh, I think that's fantastic just to see uh, how someone else was acquiring the shells and gives us a little bit of an idea of how people were going about that. In terms of her own collecting and acquisition, Henrietta certainly had strong connections with the court and with individuals who had access to shells, like Alexander Pope. Significantly, she also had her own investments in companies making use of the trade routes through which shells were traveling. She had investments in companies making use of the triangular trade across the Atlantic. So where we have shells coming from the Caribbean in the grotto, this is likely the path that those shells took in coming to Britain. You can see in the purple there. Uh, shells would have been transported alongside other goods. So Caribbean shells would likely have been carried on ships bringing massive amounts of sugar from the Caribbean plantations. Like the Duchess of Portland, Henrietta may also have had contacts within shipping that would have facilitated direct access for her. But as it stands, we just don't know. Those documents uh, haven't been found and we don't know if they exist. One thing we do know is that Henrietta was directly involved in decorating the grotto. She was putting the shells on the walls herself. In 1739, she wrote to Lord Herbert stating, I am at this time over head and ears in shells. And she got her great niece, Henrietta Hotham, involved in the project too. During her time living at Marble Hill with her great aunt, a 10 or 11 year old Henrietta Hotham wrote home to her parents around 1763 to say, I have worked so hard in the grotto and rock that it is feared I shall damage my fingers. Henrietta Howard seems to have been working on the grotto from the 1730s until the 1760s, and grotto making was a very common pastime for elite women in this period. It's often been assumed that women may have suggested or advised upon designs which were executed by workmen, but actually it often seems that women were doing the decorating work themselves, while workmen might just have been engaged to build the skeleton of the structure, so all that brickwork that Thomas was talking about earlier. When I was going through contemporary newspaper adverts, looking at how shells were circulating in 18th century Britain, I came across this little snapshot from 1754. And it gives us a great insight into the life of a woman called Alice Brace, who was helping women with their grotto making endeavors. As you can see from the advertisement, Alice had an office opposite Montague House, which is now uh, the site of the British Museum, but it's been demolished, unfortunately. Uh, and from here, she offered to teach women the art of grotto making and would readily make visits to women in their homes, bringing all of the equipment necessary, including cement and drills. So we think of this women in this period at home, politely drinking tea and having pleasant conversation, particularly elite women, um, and not with their hands covered in cement, but that was in fact the reality. Um, and again, I love that women are getting their hands dirty. And where grotto making itself is often thought of as an elite pastime, you've got to have space and the means to construct a grotto structure outside your house. This is still something that a woman like Alice Brace is participating in. And she's commercialized the knowledge that she has as well. So she's probably someone of a lower social status concerned with making a financial income through her own labor. These were networks of knowledge that Henrietta Howard was part of as well. While we saw her niece complaining about making the grotto, another way of considering it is that Henrietta was bequeathing skills to her younger relative, teaching the younger Henrietta how to make a grotto. We have a letter to an unknown recipient that mentions Henrietta Howard by name. You can see uh, the contents of the first section on screen there, and it describes the practicalities and technicalities of building a grotto. The writer is talking about the importance of different attachment techniques for different kinds of shells, 
She's encouraging the use of cement for smaller shells and additional hooks to support larger shells. And she's suggesting that the flooring be finished after the walls so as to avoid any damage. Clearly the writer had a really intimate knowledge of the process and of all of its requirements. Later on, it also gives these really great instructions on making coral at home, which is really interesting if you're trying to save money. Uh, it talks about making a mixture of wax um, and a few other things, as well as vermilion, which is a red pigment, um, and then dipping blackthorn branches into it repeatedly so that all of that wax builds up and it has the look of branched coral. So that's a great DIY grotto decorating technique. Uh, and the letter was sent by Mary Lyle of Crooks Easton, a house on the borders of Hampshire and Berkshire, not far from Newbury. Along with her eight sisters, Mary Lyle is the subject of two poems by Alexander Pope, which praise nine rural sisters and the grotto they constructed together at Crooks Easton, which doesn't survive. Henrietta was a close friend of Alexander Pope, who, as you likely know, was a keen grotto maker himself and was connected with many other grotto makers. We don't know if this is the occasion for Lyle to address Henrietta and if that's how the two women were connected or at least knew of each other. But the fact that there were these two that there were these networks of knowledge among women who were collecting shells, teaching each other how to use shells and pursuing these big grotto making projects is a really important takeaway for understanding the wider context that underpins the, creati the creation of the grotto at Marble Hill. All right, so thank you, Thomas. I will hand it back over to you. Sorry about that. Um, I had to try and find a way to unmute. <laughs> um, right. It's fascinating, the, the shell issue. Um, and the, there's so much more to explore there, really, I think. But um, coming back to the, the decoration concept and um, the fact that the 18th century, they weren't shy of what we would probably these days call either pastiche or set dressing building things that may not be permanent, but that allowed for entertainment in the short term. Um, one of the, the things that's fairly common with grottos um, is the use of water. Um, Pope, um, when he built his, made use of a natural spring under his house. Uh, and when that dried up, it seemed to be the inspiration for him to then move into changing his grotto into more of a, a museum of, of rock of various sorts. Um, as a collection rather than a, a grotto space. And many grottos seem to involve water forms of, of some sort. Um, we had this weird brick chamber to the west of the, the main grotto. The, the, the grotto chamber is underneath the big concrete slab at the top of this slide where the ranging pole is sitting. And this chamber seemed to butt up against the back of it. Initially, we thought this chamber was freestanding and wasn't actually built into the back wall. Um, and that it might be something to do with a garter robe. It's, it's fairly shallow. It's, it's nowhere near as deep as the actual grotto. And it seemed to have a tile floor. Um, and more importantly, okay, why am I, why is my slide not advancing? There we go. Uh, more importantly, it seemed to have a drain hole in the bottom corner as well, leading away. And we thought it's gotta be something to do with water going in, but not staying in because it wasn't built watertight. The, the walls aren't lined or anything like that. And we thought, what on earth is this for? Um, but further excavation showed that indeed it is actually built onto the back wall of the grotto and it is part of the main construction as far as we can tell. Um, and more importantly, along the bottom, there are three plugged up holes, three brick sort of holes that if I just highlight here on the screen, um, and if we zoom in on one of them, and you can see it just down the bottom there. Uh, there's another one just to the far right of the, the screen, just above the white bit of the, the, the photo scale. Uh, and we can zoom in even further. And you can see that it's not bonded into the wall, the, those two half bricks that are in that hole. Uh, they're not bonded in the way the rest of the brickwork is, but they sit just above the um, ceramic tile floor of this chamber. And we thought this is a bit odd. Um, so we went back in and had a look at something we've been staring at for several weeks at that point. And sure enough, we have exactly the same thing happening on the inside that we hadn't even noticed before. And we pushed through a, a metal pin, which came straight through uh, the brick joint here. So we knew that the two were connected. Um, and we've got this sort of double stack of, of half bricks 
plugging a hole that is in a wall where everything else is properly bonded in with mortar. Um, there is some mortar in these, but it's not the same. Um, and if we zoom out, we can see that we've actually got a row of three of them, which corresponds exactly with the ones on the outside. So something in that brick sort of chamber at the back is coming through the wall at the bottom level of that, that chamber. And we, we wondered what on earth that was doing. And of course, there are also three similar bricked up holes further down the wall, which is even more curious. And the only thing I could think of is that in the absence of, of a decent bit of running water into the grotto, because um, that bit of the lawn, especially in the summer when they would be more inclined to actually use the grotto, is bone dry. Um, the water table is, is quite a long way down. Um, we found in August when we were emptying out the, the well inside the, the grotto chamber that the water table is about a meter and a half below the floor of the grotto. So any water they were bringing in to use for a water feature either had to arrive by pipe, which we could pretty much rule out because we dug all the way around the grotto and there are no pipes coming in from higher ground, or it would have to have been brought in in buckets effectively to fill some sort of container that you put high level so that you could have water trickling in through some sort of water feature to give that, that sort of sound and motion of water in a cave. Um, and the best we can think of with this is that that brick space at the back essentially held some sort of container, possibly some sort of lead box. I mean, obviously not this ornate, this is a reproduction one at Layer Marnie, but there are quite a few in the grounds of Ham House that I just didn't happen to have a photo of, um, used as planting uh, devices. But you could have a similar sort of rectangular box effectively um, with pipes coming out the bottom, three of them, which you could then have taps on the, the edge of them so that um, you could turn them on and off. It'd be a big enough space to hold enough water that if it was coming through to trickle, you could have a whole day's worth of water ca cascading over whatever, maybe coming out through some sort of ornate little sculpture stuck onto the wall, um, cascading down a, a, a bit of rocks or whatever, and then landing in a tray to go out through holes at the bottom uh, through pipes that would then just be pushed into the sand, which is all around the grotto, in order for it to drain away so that the floor of the grotto doesn't become a, a damp mess when you're sitting there having your, your tea and playing cards or whatever it is that uh, Lady Henrietta would be doing in her grotto um, on her nice summer days. Um, obviously, if there was a metal box of that sort, it would have been taken out at some point and recycled, and the holes presumably plugged up. Possibly, this is part of the change from the original rustication to the, the shell impressions on the flat brick wall um, in terms of redecorating the inside of the grotto. Maybe as part of that change, this water feature goes out of use. Uh, but it's an intriguing thought and you know, worth a bit more expla exploration um, as we do our post-ex work on the archeology. span So I'll leave that there and just do a quick summary of what we've discussed tonight. Um, I'll, I've mentioned the peg tiles and the rubble that may be from missing structures on the south side of the grotto. Uh, I've mentioned um, that the interior has been modified several times, we think, in the 18th and 19th centuries. It's not all one sort of holistic pattern. There are changes in how the grotto is presented and how it's used over its lifespan. Um, the outer foyer area I've mentioned may have had a roof, I think. Um, the floor decoration suggests an asymmetric pattern rather than just a, a decorative floor. It may well have actually had some sort of mosaic picture in it. Um, Leone has, has discussed the shell trade and how, how it was complex and flourished in the 18th century uh, and how grotto decoration was also a business and not just a hobby. Um, and sort of, you know, expanded my knowledge on that subject quite, quite a bit. Um, and I've mentioned that the brick chamber to the west of the grotto, well, I, I think pretty much certainly would have held some sort of water tank. And, and that tank probably would have been accessed with a, a simple hatch above it, hidden in the shrubs kind of thing that the servants would fill up every couple of days when the grotto was in use during the summer. 
Um, so with that, I think all that remains is for us to thank all of the EHT staff and volunteers, especially, uh, who've really helped with all of this work and made the excavations possible. Um, our contact details, our emails are there on screen. So when you look this up in, on YouTube later, you can um, send us emails if you have any questions or information to add or anything like that. Um, and then obviously at the bottom, there is the website for the Marble Hill Revived project. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you, Leonie. That was absolutely fascinating. It has really um, uh, just given us a far greater depth of knowledge following your, your time when I asked you to do a talk right in the middle of when you were actually doing the dig. So um, it's lovely to be able to come back to that and understand a little bit more. Thank you both for um, enlightening us further. That's really, really super. We've got some really good questions so I'm, I'm, I'm longing to, to, to get these to you so um, just there was just a little question about that second chamber and the idea of the, that structure with the pegs and the tiles can you tell us a bit more about what those materials would be what were the pegs made of right well those things on the south side of the grotto bowl um, probably given that the 18th century they were they were quite fond of um, set decoration effectively as as a cheap and cheerful way of getting structures quickly for for instant use and enjoyment rather than building something for the future um, you might be looking at timber structures that would then be perhaps decorated um, with some sort of rendering to make them look like they're stone or uh, other materials something more substantial and thus more expensive um, and the peg tile roof um, it's fairly common, the reason they're called peg tiles is traditionally you put a wooden peg, basically a, a, a twig, uh, a, you know, a, a bit of, of hardwood um, cut to roughly the length of a nail, and you'd shove it through that peg and then you'd hang that over the wooden battens that would run sort of sideways across the rafters of your roof structure. Um, so if you've ever seen a, a, a house being re-roofed, uh, when, they, when they take off the tiles, you've got all these these battens roughly every six inches or so apart going up the roof. Um, and these days we would nail the, um, the tiles onto them because nails are cheap, they're mass produced, we have factories that make them. In the 18th century, obviously nails would have to be handmade so they'd be much more expensive. So instead what you'd do is you'd take a, a wooden peg, you, the, the, the tiles would be molded with a hole. Um, they, basically they make the tile and they actually push something through to, to make a hole before they fire it. And then you put the peg through that hole and simply hang it on the wooden battens and each layer of, of tile going up basically holds down the layer below it because they overlap to make the rainwater come off. And then obviously you put a capping across the top of that, um, you know, sort of along the ridge. And it's a fairly standard sort of, you know, pre-modern construction technique really. It's fantastic. It's great to be able to understand that a little bit more. And I hope that's answered uh, answer the uh, question that was put to mm -hmm. us. Um, there's a bit of a question about, um, Leonie, about those collecting of the shells. Um, uh, obviously, she's collecting for the grotto. Do we know whether she was collecting for her own collection as well? Because you talked about that being a thing. Um, was she doing that too? Do we know? So this is one of the things that I was really trying to um, uncover because it seems like for the most part people have like a primary collection and then they might pull shells out of their collection to use in a grotto. Um, so I was wondering whether that's something that Henrietta was doing. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the documents. It may be something that she was doing, um, but there are people who were collecting like Mary Delaney that I mentioned there. Um, she like predominantly used her best shells in her collection and then her like less rare specimens were the ones that she took out to use in the grotto and some of those would have been like native shells she produced grottos um, on the west coast of Ireland as well as um, three that she made in England and where she was making the grottos with those less rare shells she seems to have been using native uh, shell specimens and that's not what's going on at Marble Hill uh, Henrietta was using the Caribbean shells and the very impressive shells we saw that conch in the picture and that is in fantastic condition uh, even after 300 years it still looks fantastic now um, so it would have been a very prized specimen at the time as well very fragile um, 
Yeah, so I wonder if Henrietta was just doing a different thing entirely. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we just we don't have the information for that. One of the, uh, uh, someone said that she had a, um, we know that she had an inventory when she died. Was there anything on there that said anything about some of the shells that she had or was the grotto mentioned? Uh, no, no, weirdly it wasn't mentioned. Um, that is one of the first places I went to look as well. <laughs> um, I was like, please let there be something. Um, but no, um, it's kind of just pulling these little scraps of information of what other people are doing that has been the main driving force behind um, the research that I've been doing. I would love to find the kind of mother load of loads of stuff on Henrietta and it may well be out there um, in other people's correspondence. Other people might have mentioned what she's doing. There are references that like really fantastic references to the grotto in letters that she's receiving where you've got people saying, um, oh, I hope uh, the, the, the grotto is going on well. I hope the inhabitants of the grotto are doing well as though there's some sort of like fairies who are living in there or something. Um, so we do have these lovely like tantalizing mentions um, but not the like the loads of information in an inventory would be fantastic I would love that but no <laughs> well, if anyone is watching uh, you've got Leonie's details and you've got Thomas's details so um, please do get in touch and also I should mention that the uh, the bottom link also takes you to a place where you could donate to uh, help restore the grotto so that's always a good thing too so thank you for involving that uh, Thomas. Just just to interrupt um, on the subject of the conch shells in the excavations, we've had at least, you know, fragments of at least half a dozen conch shells of different sizes. So she clearly had quite a supply of them available as part of the, the grotto decoration. Whether she's still keeping her best as a private collection is a different, different matter, but um, she seemed to be able to get her hands on quite a few. Quite a few of the yes of some they because they are really quite huge and it's it's it was amazing to even find some of them very recently you know when we we thought that it wasn't going to be anything given that there was this huge uh, uh, dig already um, having taken place a couple of decades before we thought we wouldn't find anything but Thomas you we were able to find quite a lot in terms of the flint we've talked about the shells mm -hmm. um, where they've come from what about the flint because obviously that's not um, not something that you generally find in Twickenham. Uh, no, it's definitely not native to West London. It's either coming from somewhere along the south coast, because it, it, it forms in, in chalk soils, essentially, um, through processes that I don't fully understand, but essentially you get some sort of voids that form in the chalk and this mineralized material sort of builds up in them and, and effectively becomes flint as we know it. Um, so you get them either from the south coast where you've got the opposite the chalk downs and and all that you know the beachy head and places like that or um east anglia is quite prominent for them you, you get places like grimes graves where we know prehistoric man had been mining effectively on an industrial scale a seam of flint in the landscape uh, there's a whole series of 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 shafts roughly 20 foot deep where they've gone down to the layer where the flints are and then sort of tunneled out sideways. Um, and also you get flint obviously coming from, you know, the chalk lands up sort of to the west if you go out to sort of Wiltshire, that sort of direction. But either way, it's coming from a fair distance. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet, and I need to find out from our specialists whether or not it's possible to actually, you know, work out the source of a flint scientifically. Uh, it may be possible would be interesting to see. But either way, they're coming from a fair distance, presumably as cargo of some sort. Um, I can't see a reason why they would appear otherwise than someone actually saying, I want a, a cartload of flint and paying the freight for that. Um, the coastal sources are probably favored on the grounds that you can bring it most of the way by boat, which is cheaper than you know, per mile than trying to bring something by horse and cart. So she could even have had them sailed from um, all the way around the coast, straight up the Thames and offloaded pretty much at the edge of her estate. Mm -hmm. And there's another question about, um, uh, and I think this is probably for you, uh, Leone, um, around the grottos and why it was a female task and also um, where cement and drills would have been purchased. Is there any information about that at all? So we know that um, at least Alexander Pope was making his own cement and he had his own recipe. 
Um, and that seems like it kind of varied depending on different people. I can imagine that that's something Mary Lyle would have advised on in that, um, at the context of that letter as well, uh, different uh, mixes and, and different quantities of different things uh, being like the best formula for setting your, your finest shells. Um, I don't know about supplies of drills and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and that's something I only found in that um, Alice Brace advertisement. I'd be really interested to see where women are actually acquiring them from and what that looks like across the country as well, because that's very central London where Alice Brace was situated, but we don't know where um, people elsewhere in the country would have been acquiring things from. And if London was particularly a hub, it seems like it's, it's the heart of the shell trade. So whether that's true of um, dr drills, I don't know as well. Um, but it being like a, a women's kind of craft, um, it's very typical of something that has been treated as a craft and not as an artwork. And that is what it is. I think if it was um, men who had been undertaking it, it would have been um, treated differently throughout history. Um, we have other examples of shell work that we know were being produced so women were doing um, shell mosaics so where you'd put the kind of shells that you would put into a grotto but just on a panel um, and Mary Delaney who was mentioned there who was a shell artist was making sculptures so she was making things kind of look like stucco like um, candelabras and all of these different creatures um, and we know that people were putting like lions, there's a great grotto in Clifton in Bristol by someone called Thomas Goldney, and he had these big lions inside it. It was like a lion den inside his grotto. So if women were producing sculpture in shells as well, we don't know if that's something that would have been situated inside the grotto. Um, yeah, and it's often seen as something that you can just kind of, it's relatively unskilled or something. We don't, we don't think of it as as highly as we might think of like big history paintings and that kind of thing. So I think that's why it's really been sidelined as women's craft, but it was, it involved a lot of skill as we've seen. Another question has just come in about whether, what other crafts was it? Was it needlework and things like that? That was an okay women's craft? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, embroidery um and still painting as well although women weren't allowed to paint nudes until the 19th century um so that was kind of specifically for men to be doing like religious paintings and um history painting and that kind of thing for women it was much more landscape painting and things that were kind of less controversial that women could um, do in their spare time um but yeah just the fact that they have all been underplayed as a skill is just due to the fact that it's women doing it. But it's, it's fascinating to understand it a bit more. And uh, the last question that I've got is from someone who's talking about how um, uh, that uh, not much has happened since the, uh, uh, the uh, archeology span has been undertaken and what's gonna happen next. Um, and uh, I know Thomas has been working with um, English Heritage to look at the finds and explore how things will be. And certainly we're hoping that that grotto space will be um, accessible um, and uh, further works will happen um, after Christmas uh, to make that an accessible space that will bring back some of those wonderful things that uh, Thomas and his amazing team at Historic England found. So we're really looking forward to you coming to see that and coming to see the house when it's open in the spring uh, for free um, and taking a, a family trail and exploring both the, the wonderful landscape, um, having a go on the uh, nine pin bowling alley um, <laughs> and uh, that also is is, is worth noting in terms of Thomas's amazing um, archaeology as part of that, which mm. certainly gave us an understanding of where that uh, that was. And uh, and we can't wait for you all to experience this fantastic landscape that's underpinned by some really um, extensive historic research and and um, archaeological work. So. Thank you so much to our two fantastic speakers this evening. We're so, so grateful to have you talking to us and, um, and sharing your expertise with such generosity. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to welcoming you back to the grotto when it's all, all uh, finally finished and uh, looking beautiful. Thanks to all your research and understanding. 
just a little plug um, on the 6th of uh, December, we've got a fantastic talk about Henrietta and her hearing loss because it's um, it's uh, Heritage Disability Month. Um, and we'll be talking to Gobbledygook who have made a fantastic soundscape that will sit in Henrietta's bedchamber, along with um, uh, uh, one of our amazing volunteers who is now working for um, English Heritage, who um, has um, who is hearing impaired has in hearing impairment, but is also talking about some fantastic she's work work she's doing through uh, Shout Out Loud, which is our English Heritage Youth Programme. And uh, another little plug, if you've enjoyed Leonie talking today, uh, you can um, listen to her speak on the 22nd of February about the Peel family, who of course made the Coach House, uh, um, and which is now our Coach House Cafe, um, where you can buy a cup of coffee and know that you're giving back uh, as a, all the profits go to um, the charity. So do join us um, again. And uh, a huge thank you to our fantastic speakers this evening. It's been absolutely brilliant to learn more from you as ever. And uh, do uh, look at some of uh, Thomas's other fantastic uh, talks about all the finds at Marble Hill. It's really been a wonderful voyage of discovery and it's great to be able to share that so wonderfully with uh, with Thomas and also Leone tonight. Thank you so much for being here and thank you wonderful speakers. Well thank you and especially for the um, implied invitation to a, a nine pin match next summer. I'm looking forward to it Thomas. Uh, um, the, there's going to be instructions on the community um, cart and it's just being made by a most amazing fourth generation wheelwright so um, I will definitely take you up on that and I know previously in Georgian times there would have been a good old bet so um, but I only do 5p bets just saying. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> take care good night everyone. Bye-bye. So okay. Bye-bye.